so the structure of the talk, I'm going to give a quick overview of my background, family background, uh, cultural background, and then jump to kind of my experience uh, in my academic career, uh, kind of my time uh, applying to colleges, undergrad, uh, my time in undergrad, applying to grad school, going to grad school, and, and my experience uh, going through that. And I'll jump uh, directly into what computer science is. Uh, talk about the different fields that comprise computer science, as well as what you know, applying computer science, what kind of stuff is being done with computer science in industry. So just, to guide, just to give you guys an idea of kind of what's the, what, what are the projects and projects we work on. And uh, finally, I'll give a timeline of kind of my career after graduating and lessons learned uh, throughout the and also, uh, I'm hoping to keep this all kind of informal schedule, so uh, ask questions whenever uh, something pops into your head, and I'll try to answer them um, as uh, So my background, starting from left to right, uh, <coughs> my grandparents are from a small little farming town uh, near Guadalajara, Mexico. So they're essentially a farmer. They raise uh, corn, uh, animals. They sell milk as dairy products. Uh, of that sort. I never had any formal education. Um, and I guess back in the day, it was more of, of just having lots of kids to, to maintain a, a form of their so My grandmother had 15 kids. Uh, my dad's one of 15. My mom's one of 11. Um, <laughs> um, so. So it's about an hour and a half northeast of Guadalajara. Guadalajara is a, a major city, uh, but then it's surrounded by lots of little small uh, towns. So the town only has a couple hundred people. Um, so my parents met in a small town, and they, came, they immigrated to the U.S. around early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. Um, and when they got here, my, my mom wasn't working, my dad was working at the bus point. And then uh, once my mom got pregnant, uh, I was born on the way to the hospital. Uh, so she was on the way in Compton, uh, to Martin Luther King's uh, Harvard community. So my, <laughs> my birth certificate actually says Compton, California, born in Detroit. It's kind of <laughs> And it actually had the intersection, I think it was like, <laughs> so they listened to everything. <laughs> so, uh, so my, both my parents actually only finished roughly elementary school. I don't know if they offered high school in the, in the town they're from at that time. They do now. So I think they roughly finished uh, about sixth grade. And both, both my parents and also my grandparents never liked school. Uh, so, again, I grew up in, in Long Beach. You know, I was born in Compton. My parents lived, uh, lived in Long Beach. And they still live there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, I spent 17 years in Long Beach. Uh, very uh, Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> okay, so I grew up um, in the LA area in the 90s, so very huge fan of hip hop. Uh, not, not current hip hop, but like hip hop from the 90s. I love yeah. the Dr. Dre, right? Tupac. Uh, I have a Tupac quote tattooed on my back. Uh, I graduated undergrad, kind of, uh, uh, since I love music so much. Surprisingly, now I listen to the Spanish music. When I was growing up, I did not listen to expansion. I hated expansion. Um, <laughs> uh, but like now, I listen to nothing but uh, I love salsa music, uh, Latin music. You know. So yeah, so things change. People evolve. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> since Halloween just passed, I threw up a picture of me in my Halloween costume. Do people recognize who that is? Yeah. So he's a, a Mexican superhero. So kind of random aside. He's kind of like the equivalent of Superman, except he has no real superpowers. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, I love the intro to the show because whenever you watch Superman, they have the, the whole intro of faster than speed bullet, uh, more powerful than a locomotive. So the, the start of the Chaplin Colorado show basically says, more agile than a turtle, stronger than a mouse. <laughs> and, uh, but he does have a really cool hammer, kind of like Thor's hammer, but his is bright red and yellow and made out of plastic, and it's very obviously a, a kid's toy. Um, but, but it's, again, this guy's a, a, 
comedian, parody, uh, superhero. So I grew up loving comedy. Uh, so a huge fan of, of uh, jokes and things of that sort. Also, you can notice that a lot of engineers are very strange and goofy. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, but yeah, uh, in engineers tend to, to be on the, on the weirder side. I think it's good. <laughs> Sparks creativity. Okay. Uh, yeah, so going from left to right, my parents didn't have any formal schooling. Uh, my parents only finished around elementary school, and I was the first in my family to get a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, jumping to education. Okay, so when I was in high school, I didn't have a clear plan of what I was going to do. So roughly around 9th or 10th grade, and we all met with uh, a, a counselor who, who basically would try to help us out, figure things out. And uh, the counselor at my high school told me I had good grades in math and science, I should look at engineering schools. And she gave me a list and uh, basically looked at rankings. I'm like, all right, let me check out what, what schools are good. And uh, I saw the, the kind of top 20 list of, of engineering colleges. I really like computers because I'm really into video games, so I was a diehard Nintendo, Super Nintendo, N64. Uh, so I'm like, all right, this is something I really enjoy. Um, might as well see or uh, learn more about it. Uh, so I wasn't sure if I could afford college, so as a backup, I was thinking uh, military. A lot of my friends joined the military. I uh, actually had a friend that served two tours in, in Iraq. Um, so that was kind of like a backup if I couldn't afford uh, uh, going to college. Uh, so, with most things, I tend to, you know, go all out. Uh, so it's like kind of that philosophy of go hard or go home. So I ended up applying to like a dozen colleges. Um, uh, again, worst case, you get rejected by all of them. Um, actually, I take my SATs. I did okay. Um, I love the fact that my high school had uh, paid for us to take a prep class. So SAT, again, an entrance exam, something to study for. Uh, so I had friends whose parents paid for five years of SAT prep classes, and they were getting near perfect scores. I only had that one year that my high school provided, and gave me, I ended up with an okay score. Uh, so I expected to, to hopefully get, get into a few of the colleges out of a dozen. Because again, I took that top 20 list and I applied to like, all right, let me just take the top 12 or something and apply to a bunch of them. Uh, and uh, the first letter I got back was actually from UCLA, and uh, it was a rejection. And uh, I think I cried myself to sleep that night out of a little ball uh, on my bed. It was uh, pretty disheartening. Uh, but then I think like uh, a week or two passed and I hadn't heard from other colleges. And then eventually I got a second letter from MIT and it was an acceptance letter. And it was great because uh, according to the rankings, MIT was number one. I'm like, all right, not bad. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and also the other letters came in and it turned out that only uh, UCLA had rejected me, like 10 or 11 colleges had accepted me. So in the grand scheme of things, it was, it was actually not bad. Uh, so that's how I ended up going to, to MIT. And uh, again, I, I had, uh, I, was, I was kind of bitter with UCLA for maybe five or six years, but then for grad school, they actually accepted me. So uh, actually, I, I, I root for the UCLA football team now. And um, okay, so at MIT, it was, uh, I, learned, I tried to learn a little bit more about computer science just because I knew about computers but I didn't really know exactly what computer scientists did. All I knew, all I knew was video games. So I'm like, all right, I, I don't know if I really wanted to kind of graphics or I wasn't really sure what that entailed. So just doing a little research, I have a picture of Alan Turing uh, in the center. So he's considered the uh, father of computer science. He was a, basically a mathematician, um, very famous for uh, cracking the Nazi Germany code uh, during World War II. Uh, he, uh, British mathematician. And uh, he came out with like, uh, lots of ideas basically for artificial intelligence. And, and uh, so reading up on it, I, I read about security, um, making kind of like email secure, stuff on the internet secure, or read about robotics. I'm like, wow, computer science is cool. Let me uh, give this, definitely want to give this a try. Uh, and then <laughs> the MIT experience was uh, very interesting. Because MIT, again, it's, it's not number one in the US. Uh, for no reason. They take some of the best and brightest in the US as well as some of the best and brightest in the world, put them in the same school, and have them compete against each other for, for a big grade. Uh, unfortunately, the, the level I was at was kind of low. The level most other people were at was very, was very high. So my first year was really rough. 
I got pretty bad grades. Um, not very good. So MIT has a thing where if you don't maintain a certain GPA, they kindly ask you to leave. Well, it's, it's not optional. <laughs> so wasn't doing too well my first year. So I thought, okay, second year, I'm, I'm going to you know, rev it up. I'm going to do a lot better the second time. So around my sophomore year. My third semester there, same. Uh, not getting good grades. And uh, I remember I was taking boxing classes at the time at a local gym, a local boxing gym. And uh, in the middle of practice, I just started crying. It was kind of crazy. Uh, I, I'm not a doctor or a psychologist. I think I was clinically depressed. Not sure. <laughs> um, but my, my coach was actually uh, very supportive. Uh, I, I didn't think crying in a, in a boxing gym was actually the best place to do it. It just happened. Uh, so, but after that, I, I really kind of looked at what I was doing, what I was doing wrong. I, I wasn't sure how I could be at this school for a year and a half and not have figured it out yet. And it just took a while. Um, but then, uh, little by little, I, I, I got a tutor. The tutor didn't help too much. Um, but once I started going to office hours, I think that's pretty much what turned my grades around. Uh, by going to uh, TAs and to the professor who will explain a homework problem or a, the material from a lecture in as many ways as possible until you, something clicks, until you actually understand uh, what, the, what the concept was. Uh, so that really helped out. And also asking my friends to explain the homework, not just copying the answers, but actually having them explain it to me and having myself explain it to others when they ask me about it. So if you can explain a homework problem to someone else and they understand it, then obviously you, you have a very uh, strong understanding of the concept. So again, office hours and, and uh, forcing myself to understand the homework really well. Um, every office hours, I, I try my best to attend, and if I couldn't, I would email the TA uh, to make time. Um, so when I was a TA at Stanford, I did the same thing. If any student uh, emailed me, I would always make time, or if my office hours was only for two hours, I'd stay for three or four, pretty much until the last person left. Uh, as, as a way, it just helped me so much. Um, so after that, actually, my grades uh, turned around. I was actually getting really good grades. Uh, so when I graduated, I was, I think my final semester, I took like seven classes, and I got straight A's except for like a B plus. Um, it's just an effective method where, um, where again, office hours, I, I cannot stress that enough. Um, so I graduated with a decent GPA, but because of bad grades that I had, or I had received for three semesters, my GPA wasn't that, that impressive. So I really wanted to go to grad school. Uh, so that, that's kind of a, a barrier where people who are applying, even for, whether for undergrad or for grad school, it's not, it's not, life sadly isn't like a video game where someone is, you know, if you, if you think of like Mario Kart, you have, you have one character that's really fast, but then, you know, gets hurt very easily. It's one who, who accelerates very slow, uh, but it's the fastest one in the game. So these characters in the video game balance out not in life. In life, people who are good at, at every dimension are applying to these schools and you're competing against these students. So the thing is, you want to be the best at, at every category. And again, my GPA was okay, so I, I had to make it up in, in, in other areas. So there's the GRE, which is the entrance exam for uh, grad school. Again, I don't want to get your hopes down where uh, my application was, wasn't that strong. Uh, so I was worried. Uh, I was worried that Again, you have six, seven billion people in the world. Uh, luckily, they're not all applying to, to the school you're applying to. And you, you get to apply to like a dozen schools. That, and that's, again, that's what I did for grad school. I applied to like 10 or 11 schools. Um, and again, because I had no okay GPA, uh, I got waitlisted or, or rejected by like half of them. But it, again, it was okay. Um, so while I was at, at MIT, I talked to a, a UC Berkeley ad, admissions officer. And she basically told me, your GPA is just okay. You need basically a perfect score on math, uh, in, on, on the GRE, if you want to get into it, basically Berkeley engineering. Um, and I, I thought, okay, I have to get a perfect score on math on the GRE. So I studied while I was at MIT um, for about my whole senior year. I went to take the test. Uh, I sat down. 30, the first section was, was math. I'm like, great, I'm good at math. Uh, so it's 30 questions, I get through 15. I'm like, okay, I'm doing okay. I got stuck on a few. And then they tell me my time right now. So I had only answered 15 questions in the, in, out of 30 in the first section. 
Uh, yeah, so I just stood up and walked out. <laughs> um, so after that, I decided to take some time off. Uh, so I, I interviewed and, and got a job in Washington, D.C. Um, I didn't head to grad school directly. So when I went to D.C., it was nice. I was working for a defense contractor where you need a, a security clearance to actually work on government projects. So they need to do a background check. It was, it was pretty cool. They strapped a lie detector to test me and asked me about uh, basically my drug history and if I ever conspired against the U.S. government. So that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I highly recommend everyone go do that. It, it, again, they're bright, but at the same time, interesting. Um, but, um, so because I got there without the security clearance, uh, working for the defense contractor, uh, Norfolk Grumman in DC, they basically didn't really have work for me. Um, so my application was a, a certain, um, had made certain progress. So they basically had me do really simple things for about three months. So I decided to finish the work as fast as possible. So I'd get into work, do an hour of, of whatever they wanted me to, and then I'd, I'd study for the GRE for eight hours or 10 hours. So I did this for three months. Uh, and this time around when I took the, uh, the GRE, um, a lot more confident, um, although the verbal section has convinced me I don't know English. Uh, the verbal section is insanely hard. Um, but when I took, talked to the admissions officer at Berkeley as well as others from the engineering department, they told me that verbal is not, you know, you want a decent verbal score, but uh, engineering schools really want to see the strong math score. Uh, so again, for those three months, I really focused on math. Uh, so the second time around when I took the GRE, I, I got a perfect score on math. So again, these, these tests you can study for. It's, these are not impossible tests. It's really uh, being disciplined and pushing yourself. I'm naturally very lazy. I, I love to sleep and I don't like to work. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all a mental game where you have to convince yourself it's fun. Um, and even if it's not, most of the time it's not. But the thing is, the, re the rewards are so satisfying afterwards. So it's, it's delayed gratification. That, that's, that's kind of the, um, one of the life lessons I would say. Just keep pushing yourself. Just understand that it's, it's going to be worth it. Um, yeah, so it, when, I, when I applied to grad school, I had the perfect math score, my GPA was okay. So again, like I, I told you guys that students from all over the world are applying to these top colleges with, with amazing applications, but the thing is uh, a lot of these top colleges also, also want diversity. So um, they, they, they look for you know, well-rounded kids, um, so don't count yourself out. Again, you, you don't know, I don't know what the admission criteria is. Um, again, my first time around, I got into a, like 10 schools, but UCLA rejected me for some reason. And this time around, I got rejected, waitlisted by, by probably over half the schools I applied to. Um, but Stanford actually uh, sent me an acceptance, uh, which I was surprised by. And uh, what was interesting when, when I got to Stanford, and we were given advisors. So when, when you go to grad school, whether for master's or PhD, you're given an advisor to, that helps you. Uh, decide what classes to take, as well as uh, if basically to, to help you along the way to, to make sure you're successful in grad school. Uh, so my advisor was was uh, uh, Dr. Pat Hanrahan. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's won I think two uh, uh, Academy Awards, Oscars, for his work on uh, basically uh, graphics. So he you know he worked on like uh, Toy Story. Uh, he did a lot of, of uh, that kind of lighting uh, in, in graphics. Amazing, amazing guy, uh, genius. Um, actually, really nice, really nice guy. But when I first walked into his office, he picked up, uh, um, I guess, my student file. He looked at, he looked it over. He looked at my grades, and then he looked at me, and then he basically told me, "Oh, I just saw your grades. How'd you get in?" <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me some advice. But um, again, I applied what I had learned at, at MIT, basically going to office hours, um, and. Uh, understanding the material as best as I could, I applied that same method at Stanford. And again, the, the level of the classes at Stanford were just as hard as, as those at MIT. Um, but under, kind of understanding the system, understanding or knowing how to learn, knowing how to, how to approach it was a huge help. Um, so at Stanford, it was uh, more or less a straight student. Uh, so it was, it was a very rough ride. Um, uh, oh, actually, I have no work. In grad school, uh, international students were, were copying off me, which that's how you know you're doing really well when international kids copy off you. Because the thing is, 
they select the smartest kids from like 300 million US students, but they pick, select the smartest kids from like 6 billion international students. So if you have them copying off of you, you're doing something right. <laughs> it's, that's my logic, I don't know. Okay, uh, so now that was my academic uh, history background. I'm jumping into what is computer science? Um, so computer science, you know, if you go to any computer science department at any university, you can have a long philosophical discussion on what the difference between computer science and computer engineering is. Some people say that computer engineering is more applied of actually building stuff. Uh, computer science is more the math and logic uh, behind it. Uh, I personally don't care. Uh, it's, it's really just uh, people just love arguing. Um, at the end of the day, it, it's just you're using, uh, you know, you're programming and using computer science concepts. It, it's all well and good with me. So if you, if you go to, I know, like University of Texas Austin, they actually have separate departments for each. Um, Stanford has a joint. Uh, MIT has a joint. It's fine. Uh, so anyway, that's one argument you'll come across. So if you're wondering what the difference between engineering, computer engineering, and computer science, you're fine. Whatever school, whatever the school is offering, it's probably going to be the same thing. Um, if it's different, just know one's more math, more math -y. More, more logic based. The other one's more actually building and coding. Uh, so I, I took uh, Stanford's way of roughly categorizing the fields in computer science. It's not extensive. There's more fields, but these are kind of the general fields. So the first one is artificial intelligence. So when you go to a computer science department, you can have uh, different kind of specializations. One would be AI. So AI is pretty much how machines think and how they learn. So you can think of Watson. Uh, Watson was the IBM computer that competed in, in Jeopardy and did really well. Uh, so he uses a lot of, of uh, really kind of artificial intelligence, a lot of statistics are really huge. So Watson would basically uh, look at tons of data really fast, as fast as it could, and it would get a confidence, it would use statistics to give itself a confidence interval or a level. If, it's, if it was above some threshold, maybe 70%, then it would have chimed in and answer the question. Uh, so. The first test runs actually Watson did horribly. Um, but then, again, if you raise the, the confidence level high enough and then you, you mess with the algorithms enough, it, it did surprisingly well. Um, and, and, and it ended up being the Jeopardy champions. So it was very specialized for that. And now they're trying to use it for, for uh, uh, I know in the medical field, for uh, diagnoses. So it's actually doing better than doctors now, uh, at least in some initial tests. It's, it's, it has the ability to, again, look through tons of, of data, tons of literature, incredibly fast. Um, so that's, we're trying to harness that to just make better decisions. Uh, IBM is also working on cognitive computing. So what's nice about the human brain, so, so the con cognitive computing is trying to model the you know, human brain with, with circuits and chips. And the reason there's interest in doing that, the brain, has incredible processing power and very low energy use, it, low power use. So having a computer that can do tons of computations that uses very little electricity, very little electricity is, is extremely ideal. So that's another project that IBM is working on. I'm jumping over to human-computer interaction. Human-computer interaction is basically how humans interact with machines. I think uh, just recently, recently read Steve Jobs' book. Steve Jobs amazing kind of genius when it comes to design. Probably one of the biggest jerks in the world, but he was, again, just very good at design. So if you read his book, uh, he saw uh, some, something interesting. He saw the, the kind of graphical user interface where on a computer you, you move a mouse and you click on stuff. So back in the 80s they didn't have that. Steve Jobs saw that concept at Xerox Labs, basically copied it and came out with, it. Came out with uh, his own improved version and it was better. But, uh, Xerox tried to sell theirs and it just wasn't as good. So c was really good at taking something, designing it better, uh, and releasing it. So you can think of the iPod, the scrolling wheel. That was very, very, very different. Um, think of the iPhone, the, the glass touch screen. So whenever I think about HCI, I, I definitely think uh, Steve Jobs is, is, a, is a great example for a lot of the Apple products. Um, and also, they're very easy to use. So my parents are terrified of computers and technology. I got my mom an iPad, and, and she, she picked it up pretty quickly. Uh, although, 
but just, again, random aside. I tried to Skype with my mom for the first time, and she got it working, and I was talking to her, but she was in LA, so I was talking to her over Skype, and I was telling her her video wasn't working, and I told her, there's like four icons at the bottom of, of, of Skype, four icons, and uh, her video wasn't working, so I told her to press the icon that looks like a camera, and she said, is it the one that looks like a piece of cactus? What looks like a cactus? Apparently a microphone looks like a cactus. It's a Mexican one. Yeah, but she figured it out. And it, it, it's amazing that, um, again, she never really messed with technology her whole life, and for her to be able to pick up an iPad and, and talk to her son at 600 miles away and over video. And it was cool, my dad was in the background shirtless and I don't know what he was doing, but it was, it was a very, very beautiful moment. Um, so again, UCI, uh, knowing how to, how to you know, work with machines, making it very easy to use. If your product is not easy to use, then it's not going to do well. Uh, security, uh, making machines secure. So you can think about email or when chatting with your friends online using Facebook, uh, checking email. A lot of that stuff has to be encrypted because if you access it and Say the, your email is going over you know, the internet in plain text. Anyone can basically read it. So there's a thing called encryption that basically takes takes your message, turns it into gibberish, sends it over the, the wire, you receive it, and then you decrypt it, which basically go from gibberish to, to plain text. Um, I, think, uh, I have a picture of a shirt that has uh, this thing called a DCSS algorithm. So back in the 90s, um, uh, when they came out with DVDs, they used a CSS, a content scrambling system, which is a way to encrypt the movie. So even if you tried to read the movie off the DVD, it was all gibberish. Only the DVD player could, could decrypt it. Um, so the, the movie industry released these uh, DVDs with the CSS uh, encryption algorithm. Basically, three, three people one of them, who was a 16-year-old kid from Norway, uh, broke <laughs> the encryption algorithm um, and released it. And uh, actually, he, he got sued. They never found out who the other two people were, but he got sued, uh, saying he can't release that. So people started printing shirts. I had, a, I had a TA at MIT who had this algorithm on a tie that he wore to class one day. So I thought it was uh, pretty interesting how nothing's secure. Nothing's 100% secure, just keep that in mind when surfing the internet. It's a very dangerous place. Um, so even uh, when, when, when uh, chat first came out, so AOL Instant Messenger, by default it was not like, it was not encrypted. So basically anyone who was connected to the same line as you were could read, read what you were talking about. Uh, <laughs> the first iPhone was horribly insecure. Uh, it gave root access, so basically uh, root access on, a, on any machine allows you to do whatever you want. Normally, the smart, the smart thing to do is uh, to give all your applications, your browser, all your programs, uh, limited access. iPhone <coughs> root access to everything, so all you have to do is break into one thing, and then from there you, you have complete control over the phone. The, iPhone, the first iPhone just really didn't take many security measures, and uh, once it was hacked, it was a huge problem. Um, again, uh, Apple's definitely got better. Same thing with Facebook. I remember when Facebook sent uh, uh, security, one of the security, one of one of the people on the security team, and he told me that he's one of, of seven people on Facebook security. I was a little worried. Uh, I, <laughs> this was years ago. Uh, I don't know. I hope they, you know, I'm sure they're really smart guys, but again, uh, security is, is not true. It's really hard. It's a lot of fun to work with. Because again, I took a, a class at Stanford where the first homework was hacking into machines, old machines that, that we knew the vulnerabilities. They would explain how to do it, and we had to go ahead and do it. Security, a very fun field. Next, we have systems. You know, systems, think of the internet, that's a huge system. So when you connect to the internet, here at your school, connecting to some school network, the school network is connected to some regional network, that regional network is probably connected to the internet backbone, so we have these super high speed uh, machines spread around the world. So it'll connect to that backbone, if you talk to your friend in New York, it'll connect to their regional network, their school network, or their, um, their home. Uh, so it's just amazing, the simple fact that the internet works is it, pretty mind-blowing, and understanding that. And uh, again, there's uh, so many examples of systems, think about your, all your phones can call each other, that's, that's the network. <coughs> um, uh, 
retail stores like Target, Macy's, they log every transaction. They, they all, all these kind of registers are connected in some way, and they, they push all this data out somewhere. Uh, so this is a major field. Uh, last uh, is uh, theory. So theory is, is more, this is where people start talking about the difference between computer engineering and computer science. So theory really provides a, a toolkit. It's uh, basically tools to how to analyze and evaluate your, al your, com your algorithms. Uh, algorithms are pretty much computer programs. Computer programs kind of how do you do something. So an algorithm, just think of it as a recipe on, on how to do something. Um, so it's, it's, it's more if you're uh, more interested in, in the math and the logic uh, and if you, know, if you want to evaluate if your program is, is, is it fast, or can it be faster, is it secure, um, you know, if it's not secure, how, how fast can it be hacked? So again, back to the DVD uh, algorithm, CSS, had a very short uh, key, so it was using a key to, to uh, tell the DVD, like, oh, I'm a DVD player you can trust. It was a 40-bit key, 40-bit key, you can crack that in a few seconds with modern computers. In 1999, it took less than 24 hours. Uh, so a 40-bit key is bad just because it's too short. Uh, so you want like a 256-bit <coughs> key that's with modern computers, you, get, you can't crack that yet. And someone might figure out using again, the, the concept behind computer science theory, how to crack it even faster. So it, it's an interesting field where you look at the math and the logic um, uh, behind uh, computer programs. Okay, uh, so now jumping from kind of what computer science is comprised of, I just wanted to give a few examples of how it's applied in industry and products. Although I did allude to a few products in the previous slide. Uh, so one interesting uh, field where computer science is being applied is uh, biology and in medicine. So I don't know if you guys have heard of this program called Folding at Home. So I have a, a screenshot of uh, one of the kind, of kind of the application I work. So uh, protein folding at home, it, it's, it's a program you can install on your computer, so when you're not using your computer, it, it uh, connects to um, pretty much an, a machine application that stamp that sends it some work to do. So when your, your computer is idle, uh, it, and you have this application installed, you get some stuff, uh, basically a protein, um, <coughs> uh, a molecule, and pretty much simulates it, simulates how it moves to see what the final form of the protein is. This is really important in medicine uh, because again, proteins they drive a lot of, uh, of, of you know they drive the human body. And for figuring out if a protein is going to fold in a bad way, causing cancer, that's that's something they want to see. Or if they develop the drug, will it interact with the protein? So basically, for a lot of uh, detection, a lot of uh, uh, medicine, uh, uh, computer science again, it's using the ability to simulate these things really fast and just lots of computation. Doing this in a lab would just take days where you can have something that just takes a few hours. Um, next, uh, graphics. Uh, so graphics, like user interfaces, um, when, when you want a website, uh, uh, the interface to the website, things like that. Image editing, there's, I, I love using a GIMP image editor because it's free, but then there's a, a Photoshop which allows you to to uh, modify photos, so if you look at any fashion magazine, you'll see that what you see, the, the models are, are not even real. It, it, they're they're uh, photoshopped to the point that it's just not even realistic. That's the beautiful, beautiful thing about images, you can, you can just play around with stuff. Uh, so I, I, I just love putting my friends' faces onto, onto stuff, so that's what I do with, with, with uh, my version of, of the program. Um, and there's also video games. So again, when I, I the, the reason I got into computer science was because I was really interested in video games. So you had this really simple, not simple, but not very powerful Nintendo uh, from back in the 80s. This was like early 80s when it came out with Nintendo 8 bits. It only had like 64 colors. Every every game was only like a megabyte. My presentation is three megabytes. So this is basically my, my presentation is bigger than three Nintendo video games. And the graphics were uh, not that great. And now you have uh, have screenshots of NBA 2K14 where insanely realistic uh, graphics. And my advisor that I was, I was talking about, uh, he did a lot of, of, uh, of work on, on lighting. So typically uh, a video game console has a physics engine that simulates a lot of, of physics. So lighting, the way light reflects off, off your body as well as 
as uh, reflecting on other stuff. So you can think of, of light hitting you, bouncing off stuff, and and uh, so these the computer processors have insane amount of, of um, kind of physics logic um, put into them. Um, and also at Stanford, uh, they offer a 3D videoing class, which I took, which was probably one of the highlights of my academic career. I didn't even think it was possible that uh, I was going to design and build a video game. Uh, so you have four weeks, which is probably the four most intense weeks of my life uh, with me and, me and a friend uh, for the, the final project, we basically built a video game. Uh, so we actually built one that was like really neat. Uh, there were people in the class that were also just insanely good. I think someone built like a Transformers game. I was blown away by that. Mine was like pretty simple. Uh, you just had like a, a, a gun and you shoot stuff. Um, had cool special effects. Uh, <laughs> there's had like tanks. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's, it's just a lot of fun. It's a lot of matrix, um, uh, matrix, pretty much algebra, so linear algebra. So be good at calculus and linear algebra if you want to get into video games. Specifically, uh, designing kind of the physics in the game. If you want to design how the characters look, that's more uh, art design. If you want to do more image editing and things of that sort. They take people of so many different disciplines to build a video game. There's so many different tasks that require so many different skills. So if you're into video games like I am, uh, you know, there's probably a place for you to just kind of figure out, search around what, what you know, type of people they need. Uh, next is uh, mobile computing. So everyone has typically has a, a cell phone nowadays, uh, smartphones. Uh, so it's, again, it's a all your cell phones are a giant network. Uh, Google does an amazing job with uh, harnessing the power of cell phones. So if you look at Google traffic data, when you're, when you're traveling, Google's actually logging how fast you're going. So it, it can give you real-time data on, on accidents and uh, the speed, or the, basically the traffic on a highway. Why? Because your phone's reporting how fast you're going. <laughs> Privacy concerns, uh, I know Google's gotten into trouble with that, but they keep saying that they don't look at the data, they just feed it into a, a machine that, that gives traffic and things like that. But um, it's, it's um, definitely, oh actually, I skipped information management and analytics. The phone, I guess uh, Google's privacy issues also feeds into that. Uh, so your mobile phones are generating lots of data. Um, so for, for analytics, if you want, uh, you want to analyze, you know, what can you learn from this data? Google took advantage of uh, basically your, your GPS data to give great traffic reports. Um, but you have retail stores. There was an article on Target where they analyzed uh, customer data. So they noticed that the best time to get new customers uh, typically was when they were going to have a baby. Uh, because when uh, you're about to have a family, you're typically overworked, very tired, you don't want to go to different stores for different items. So a, a store like Target is perfect uh, because if you go there, you're tired, um, you know, you just want to get everything you need, whether it's groceries, clothes, all at the same spot. So they noticed the trend that people who were, were expecting kids or people with kids were the best, uh, it, that was the best time to, to try to get them to go to your store. So they analyzed the, so they had a set of women who, who volunteered their information to say that they're pregnant uh, for like coupons and things like that. But they also wanted to identify women who had not reported that they were pregnant so they can start sending them kind of brochures and stuff for baby-related stu uh, stuff. So they basically analyzed uh, the data of women they knew that were pregnant versus just women that, that had their little club cards and were, uh, because they were logging everything they were buying. They, they noticed trends such as um, women who were pregnant uh, tended to buy a lot of lotion, uh, unscented for some reason. A lot of soap, also unscented. Uh, vitamins, zinc, magnesium, calcium. Uh, so then they started sending these brochures with uh, kind of, you know, baby stuff to, to these women. And supposedly uh, they were sending them out to teenagers too, who either didn't know they were pregnant or they knew but their parents didn't know. And that was a huge issue. Um, so they had to scale back a little bit where they didn't send brochures with nothing but baby stuff, but they just had it hidden in the in the in the brochure um, to not be creepy. But they still wanted the customers. <laughs> so that's the type of stuff you can do with computer science. Um, you can mine data and learn about people. And uh, Google put out a paper where if they monitor your your 
your uh, track, uh, your internet uh, activity, the websites you visit, you leave a fingerprint after just visiting a few websites. Um, that every unique, every person is genuinely unique, uh, or have a pretty persistent uh, internet surfing patterns. Uh, so again, a lot of interesting work. Uh, a lot of questions when it comes to privacy and, um, and analyzing data. And again, everything you do is logged uh, for the most part. That is why stores give you club cards uh, because they want to see what you're buying um, and things like that. Uh, so finally, uh, robots and uh, robotics and vision. So I highly recommend you, you guys go to like a manufacturing plant. I went to a BMW manufacturing plant and it was unbelievable how much of the work in building the car is automated. So you have a lot of robotic arms just working in sync uh, that, that open doors and paint the car and, and assemble it uh, with no one involved. It's just mind blowing how, again, different machines are, are, first of all, doing what they're doing and working together in sync. Um, and uh, robots also used in, in, in medicine. At Stanford, they have a lot of work being done on using a robotic arm to do surgery. So again, uh, humans are kind of limited to how, I guess, uh, small, uh, again, the human body has a lot of small like, ligaments and bones and things like that. And a human hand can only be so stable. So if you can have a robotic arm that can, uh, with very high precision that can work at a much smaller granularity than a doctor can with his hands, that's great. So at Stanford, they're working on a robot where there's a robotic arm that is doing the procedure inside the person and doing the surgery, and, and the doctor's controlling it. Um, so you can have kind of bigger movements, and he's looking into a video camera, and you have bigger movements, but it's, also, it's just really small, um, precise movements inside the, the body. So it's just amazing work uh, being done there. And uh, you also have self-driving cars. Uh, so this one's pretty interesting. Where, um, I'm sure some of you have heard of standing the uh, self-driving car. Uh, so the government um, put out a grand challenge in, I think, 2004, where they told universities, uh, build a car that can drive across the Mojave Desert. It's 150 miles. Uh, and win a huge cash prize. And uh, you go, 20 or 30 schools entered the, the grand challenge in, in 2000, uh, 2004, and none of the cars made it. I think the, the car that lasted the longest was, was seven miles out of 150. <laughs> uh, and then, they, because no one collected the prize, they offered it again in 2005, the following year. They had the same challenge. And this time, I think it was um, maybe 23 out of the 25 cars made it. And uh, Stanford's uh, Volkswagen uh, came in first. And the, the initial prototype basically had five lasers on top uh, that would um, scan the surrounding area. It would use GPS data to figure out where it was and use a video camera to see uh, what was ahead of it. Um, so it was just a huge, um, huge advancement in just a year of going, a car just going seven miles versus most of the cars completing a, the 150 mile course in the desert. By the way, when they let the car go in the desert, they could not touch it. it basically, if it got stuck in a ditch, it had to get itself out. Um, so it had to do the 150 miles by itself. But again, that was pretty amazing. And then DARPA had the urban challenge where they wanted the car to drive inside a city. Um, so they, they modeled the city, and again, the, the cars did extremely well. And I know uh, the guy that was in charge of the project uh, of Stanley, the self-driving car, is, uh, is at Google, and they continued the project. And uh, I think they just, in Nevada, they just legalized it for cars to, for self-driving cars to be on the road. Um, and and uh, out of all the tests, I think it, the car's only been in like one or two accidents, and that was caused by the other person crashing into the car. Um, and it wasn't the car's fault. So major implications for the future, because you can think of, of a major city, take New York or LA, horrible traffic, they can just outlaw uh, uh, cars and you have, to, you have to use this self-driving service. So you basically have a limited number of cars that will basically pick you up where you need to be picked up, drop you off, and just constantly driving around. Um, I think Google has a golf cart that does that at their Google campus, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so that was, again, a uh, crash course to what computer science is, kind of stuff they're doing in industry, uh, kind of projects we work on. Um, Again, it's not just computer science, it just takes a lot of 
engineering, because again, the, the self-driving car has like 100,000 lines of code, so we need computer science people. Uh, but they also have mechanical engineering people to build uh, a lot of the components. And again, a lot of people from lots of fields, just like engineering. Um, so again, a brief timeline of my career. Uh, so as an undergraduate, I worked at a space technology company called TRW. Uh, and then after that, I got an internship at IBM Japan. Uh, so that was pretty cool being in, in uh, Tokyo, uh, the, the Tokyo Research Laboratory. Uh, yeah, so I studied Japanese at, at MIT for two years. That was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, I stopped uh, practicing and I forgot most of it, uh, which sucks because it's two years of hard work. Uh, one of these days, I, I, I will be fluent. Um, uh, so after, after undergrad, uh, because I didn't go directly into directly to grad school, I, I spent some time uh, a year at North of Grumman, and that's when I applied for security clearance. This is a space technology company, too. I was working on web applications, basically, for the CIA and FBI. Uh, so that was actually a lot of fun. Um, but my long-term goal was still to, to get an uh, advanced degree, and North of Grumman wasn't willing to, to give me money. They, they basically told me, you need to stay on the East Coast, and you need to work part-time, and we're only giving you, like, Seven thousand dollars a year. Like, well, I got to Stanford. It's across the, you know, on the West Coast. It's like forty-five thousand a year. <laughs> um, so I actually just, so oh, I actually never talked about the, the finances behind college. So when I got into MIT, MIT and Stanford, I believe they adopted a policy where um, if your yeah, household income is below one hundred thousand dollars, they don't even charge you tuition. So I actually went to uh, MIT and I just had to pay for housing and food. Um, so I took loans for that. Um, I did not get charged tuition. For Stanford, gr like grad school is different than undergrad. So grad school, I, I did the bullet and, and uh, I got like a $45,000 loan for my first year. Uh, but then I was applying to scholarships like it was you know, a part-time job. And I eventually, eventually landed a fellowship with IBM where they paid for, uh, I think, four quarters out of, out of my six. Um, so I still had loan debt. Uh, when I graduated, but nowhere near as much, uh, because I, IBM basically told me, and part of the program was, you work two summers with us, and we'll pay for for four quarters of, of your school. And also, I was working as a TA, and that helped uh, to offset costs. And, um, so I'm, I'm actually loan-free. It, it took a while to pay it back. Um, but again, engineering has a, a very high uh, earnings potential. That's what's beautiful, beautiful about engineering. It's a very highly sought after its job. Uh, there's not enough people to actually fill the engineering positions uh, in the US, uh, much less across the world. So it's, it's a very great field to be in. Uh, and and uh, so because of the, the fellowship I got from IBM, I, I worked for them for two summers. I really loved the group that I was in and uh, continued uh, in that group. So it's, uh, I, I came to the research um, department. So we, we do uh, a lot of what's fun in prototyping. So we basically come up with ideas and, and try to build them as fast as possible uh, to see if, if uh, they'll gain traction or not. A little bit about one of the projects that I was working on. Um, I'm still kind of working on it, where you, you have these major computer systems. Uh, so again, going back to Target, they, they're funneling all their, their, their data into this huge com computer network uh, or computer system, data center. Which has tons of tons of uh, tons of computers connected to tons of machines uh, that uh, are dedicated to just storage. So you can think of, of this computer connecting to some data center somewhere, and it just has a ton of hard drives. So I don't even really need to save anything on this machine. I can just push everything off into into the hard drives that are in this uh, other location. It's kind of the idea behind cloud computing. Um, so again, at this data center, they have lots of machines, but they also have different types of storage. You have uh, hard drives that operate at different speeds. You have 15,000 RPM revolutions per second, or per minute, and 10,000 RPM um, disks. So typically, you want if you're running a website, you want your your website uh, pictures and things like that on very fast um, uh, disk or on solid state drives. Solid state drives are really fast because they're not mechanical; it's all electrical. Um, so you typically want uh, important data on on these more expensive, higher performing types of, of, of devices. But then the thing is, like, no one checks their, their G-chat history, their fa Facebook messages from like 10 years ago. You can afford to put that on, on tape or even on super cheap disk. So uh, 
the research group I'm, I'm in where we do, um, I guess, optimization services. We looked at it and we basically came up with an application or a program that will move stuff around. Basically, it will monitor, like, all right, this stuff looks like it's old. Okay, um, So it sees that as stuff is old, it moves it down to cheaper storage, so it basically reduces the cost uh, for you to have your, you know, your website running there. It just lowers the cost of everyone involved. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, again, finding ways to optimize the way stuff, stuff is done. Okay, so uh, life lessons from, again, the last 10 years of, of school and, and working. Uh, so you want to, I guess one of the first things is to challenge yourself constantly. Uh, so again, I'm very lazy, uh, but um, I think I've, I've found a lot of, of uh, most of my experiences that, that have required me to just be very uncomfortable have, have resulted in being very rewarding. So again, I took Japanese for two years. That was insanely hard. Um, but spending time in Japan and, and you know, going out drinking with my, my managers and talking Japanese, amazing. Um, when I was in, in undergrad, I was, I was boxing. I terrified being punched in the face, but I'm very used to it now. Um, <laughs> so the reason I got into, into Spanish music, uh, I started, uh, I wanted to learn to dance. I didn't know how to dance. I, Felt really dumb dancing for like a year. Then I got decent at it and I started competing. So I actually do compete in the Bay Area <coughs> dance competitions. Um, so it, it's, it's fun. Uh, but like if you can realize that when, whenever you try something new, whether it's at school or whether it's outside of school, you're going to suck really bad for a while, if not for a long time. Uh, <laughs> and and that, that just comes with the territory of learning something new. There, there are some people who are just gifted and they pick stuff up faster, um, very fast. And that's fine. That leads into the second second bullet point of don't compare yourself to others. I think that was out of this whole list, uh, one of my uh, probably my favorite. Uh, this is the advice I got from a professor at Stanford, where again, there's always someone better than you. There's always someone smarter than you. Some, someone more athletic. Um, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Um, it's it's kind of life in school. It's kind of a mental game where. You have to stay optimistic. You have to stay positive. You have to tell yourself that you can do it, or else you know you end up failing out of MIT, or you end up failing out of Stanford, or for whatever. Uh, that could have been my case. So it's it's just you know there have been so many studies that have done that have been done that, that show that not the smartest kids uh, are always the most successful. It's pretty much the kids who stick stick to it, um, who are very persistent, very resilient, and lastly, just work hard. But again, I. I Love sleeping, um, but you, you have to. It, this is a, a lifelong uh, challenge that you have to work hard. You're not going to want to it most most days. Or, so it's just something you have to constantly remind yourself. I have to constantly remind myself. Remind myself. Um, and at the end, just a little graphic. I'm always on a computer, uh, which is nice. I like sitting down. Uh, well, thank you for your time. Thank you.